Hello, this is David Brim, and I'm the founder of Orlando Entrepreneurs. We are the hub for Orlando entrepreneurship, and our mission is to connect, cultivate, and celebrate our local entrepreneurs. We bring together our local entrepreneurial ecosystem to help impact our entrepreneurs, their companies, and our local economy. Learn more at orlandoentrepreneurs.org. Now over to Josh Wilson to get forward with our show. Good day, fellow entrepreneurs. My name is Josh, and I'm the host of Orlando Entrepreneurs. This show is about entrepreneurship and those awesome people building these businesses. So on today's show, we're going to have a conversation with Barbara. Barbara is an incredible entrepreneur, and I skipped her last name because her her last name is actually difficult. It's Les Cano, right? Did I say it right? Yep. Yeah. Okay, cool. (laughs) <laughs> so Barbara Lescano, who's a food entrepreneur, and we're going to dive into her story and her inspirational message that she has for you, our wonderful audience here in Orlando. So Barbara, welcome to the show. Hi. Hi, Josh. Thanks for having me. <laughs> it's good to have you. So uh, tell us a little bit about what the heck a food entrepreneur is. So who are you and what do you do? Okay, so uh, food entrepreneur, blah, 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 if I can say the word, I think you've interviewed a few of them before, because um, I've listened to them, uh, is someone who is trying to break into the food industry at some point, whether it's ready-made goods, whether it's farmer's markets, whether it's retail or grocery or refrigerated, there's so many facets of food. Um, I don't know, honestly, if you would call a restaurant tour or someone like a chef opening a restaurant a foodpreneur, but I don't see why not. Um, but yeah, so it's someone who is coming into um, their own and trying to start a business in the food industry. Um, and so what I started a couple years ago in May was our two year mark. Um, I started Sweet Babs, which is, it sounds gimmicky, but it's based off of my name because it's Barbara Dulce in Spanish. Um, and that's my first and middle name. So that is a line of all natural Cuban sauces, almost Cuban barbecue sauces that um, are really all purpose. They're based off of family recipes that go back generations in my family. And um, people have typically thought of them as like marinades and uh, grilling sauces. But the beauty of these is they're all natural. They're gluten free, vegan, dairy free, soy free. So they're really um, amenable to a lot of dietary sensitivities that we see in modern day. But then in addition to that, because they're all natural, it just takes away all the restrictions on how to use them. Because if I bought something, a mojo sauce, which is what we've got out now, which is Mama's Mojo, which is our tried and true original, and then Papa's Mojo, which is the same but spicy because I like to sweat when I eat so that everything has to be spicier for me. Um, typically, if I would have bought Mojo or Mojo, however you want to say it, at, at a store in the past, it would have been laden with preservatives. And I wouldn't have used it to put on my salads or put on eggs or sandwiches or anything like that. But because we've taken all of the bad stuff out, then you can really use it, you know, just for the flavor for any kind of dish. Nice. So you got a mama's and a papa's uh, mojo. Now, I always thought it was mojo. Uh, so <laughs> that's in my ignorance. So actually hearing you say mojo, that's uh, it's exciting. I'm, I'm learning something new. So I always joke that as long as you're talking about it, it doesn't really matter what you call it. <laughs> Mojo, moho. I'm like, yes, that's it. Exactly. Um, because I say it because I grew up speaking Spanish. So moho is what we called it. But then, and if you go to Miami, everybody says, oh, mojito, you know, but if you come up here or you go to Tampa, you'll still get like, hey, it's mojo or moho, or I was talking to a, a food entrepreneur in California and he was, like, I don't even know what moho or mojo is. You don't see that here in grocery stores on the West Coast like you do in um, in Florida. Nice. So, all right. So this is this is pretty cool. I'd love to hear how you started the mama moho and the, the papa moho. Like, how did you get your start as a foodpreneur or food entrepreneur? How did you get your start in this, Barbara? So... A lot of my kind of how I got started story goes back to like family, faith, and fellowship. So my 
life, I like growing up, I was always super creative. I sung, I played piano, played viola, um, it, it just really anything having to do with music or like thinking outside the box, I was super excited about. And then I'm the daughter of, I mean, my parents adopted me, so I'm only half Cuban biologically, but they adopted me when I was 12 days old. So, I mean, they're my parents, right? Um, but they're immigrants. They came over in 71 from Cuba and Spain and Costa Rica. Like they hustled to get to a better place for themselves. And they knew how to support that I loved the arts. But then when it came, came time to go to college, they were like, okay, you need to study. So you don't need to work so hard for a paycheck. Like follow your dream, but first go to college and get a degree in something logical that pays the bills and all of those things. That is really honestly good immigrant advice it is solid advice you know do something that'll go the distance for you um that will provide you an honest living a lot of people get that advice so but i always joke everyone who has a plan b never follows plan a and so i said okay well i'll study economics because i like uh i like language and i like numbers and i knew enough at that age to know I didn't want to be pigeonholed into one industry and economics really could run the gamut, right? It's, it's going to be applicable in every aspect of life. Um, so I followed that, but I, I always joke I'm a recovering black and white thinker. So I kind of put all the, my artistic side in a box and I shut the lid for a while and I tried to open the lid every so often. And then I was like, no, 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 I'm going to shut that down. So um, point is, Fast forward a few years to when I had my daughter and even in economics and like I worked in finance for the greater part of 20 years, it felt like playing dress up, right? Like I put on a suit and everybody would go, oh, great, you've got such a great presence and set it up. And then I'd go home and just kind of feel a bit like it wasn't that imposter syndrome, you know? And when I had my daughter, um, I wasn't in a great place personally. And I had lost a lot of myself. I was in a flailing marriage at the time. And I just felt like, here's this clean slate, this new life. And I don't feel like I have anything left to give her. And I, what that translated to me was that I needed to lead by example, right? Like I needed to show her how to be a woman, how to be a friend, a sister, a daughter, a mother, uh, a human being. And I, felt like I have to, you know, of course, you sacrifice for your kids, you do all these things, but I didn't feel like I didn't know who I was. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know what I had to give. And that kind of started my path back to, okay, let's be creative. Let's open this back up. Let's start writing. Let's start music. Just very, very painstakingly slowly um, to to get back there. And that way I could at least show her and not just say chase your dreams, but don't, don't look at me when you do that because I'm not chasing mine or don't, um, don't do as I say, not as I do kind of thing. And so I started slowly but surely kind of getting back into being creative and getting back into who I was. And I ended up getting divorced. And at that point in time, I was like, you know what, I'm starting life again, and I'm starting it again on my terms. I'm not starting it again as someone's child who's, you know, um, trying to please other people or under anyone's regulation. So what does that look like? Went back into finance and still felt that disconnect and um, started just exploring more creative options. And I said one day, hey, for shits and giggles, you know, pardon my French, my dad had always made this mojo sauce and everybody always fought for it and was like, no, I'm taking the rest home, blah, blah, blah. And so I sat there one day and I'm like, dad, what if we bottled the sauce? Like I have no background, but if we just bottled it and what, what would that look like? And of course, typical Cuban male that he is, he goes, Barbara, no se puede hacer. It can't be done. And I was like, okay, why? And he goes, because nobody can make it like me. So I was like, okay, let's take one step down from the pedestal. And just what if we came within like a 10 or 20 foot radius of getting that sauce bottled and what it tastes like to you made in your kitchen. 
And he was like, that piqued his interest. So I started it as a hobby um, that he and I could do together. And I really waited for him. I called a friend of mine who does business law. And I said, hey, Melissa, you know, like, I want to, if I want to bottle a sauce, what do I do? Where do I even begin? So she connected me with a patent person um, and a trademark person and the attorney. And then she pointed me towards a co-packer, um, which at that point I had no idea what it was. So a co-packer is uh, someone who produces a mass batch of whether it's a rub or a sauce or a jelly, like that's, you know, when you look at big corporations, they use much larger manufacturers. So that's who would produce that for you. I'm sure you probably know. Um, but so I, I just toured the co-packing facility. I just explored that option with my dad. And then we did a lot of R&D in our kitchen over the course of a year. So it took a year to get the recipe to where we wanted it to be. Um, I realized there were so many regulations um, at that point, but I'm probably digressing a little bit. But so we, we worked on that recipe for a year. And along the course of that year, I sat down to put a business plan together. And when I sat down to put the business plan together, I realized it was more than just a hobby for me. I realized it wasn't like, hey, let me just bottle this and or let me just, you know, see if what this is like. I realized that what I grew up eating as Cuban food, what I grew up, the memories that I made growing up, that was where my, that was what meant everything to me. It wasn't about what the food was on the plate, but like my parents' house, when we grew up, we called it the refugee house. It didn't matter. They were, my mom worked in sweatshops. My dad was a carpenter. It didn't matter whether we were, had matching plates at the dining room table or it was on a two by four table that my dad put out in the backyard. Those memories were invaluable. And everybody who showed up at their house had a seat at the table. It didn't matter what time you showed up, who you brought with you, there was food to go around. And that, that was where kind of my why came from and our motto, which is bring love to the table. Um, because to me, I, I didn't know how to embody these memories that I had. And I felt overworked. I felt overstretched, overcommitted. Um, I felt like you know, I think a lot of us feel nowadays is that we want to give our families or ourselves even just for a meal so much, uh, but we don't know where to begin because there's so many expectations that are placed upon us and so many um, demands on our time. And all you want is like, that's all you want is a good meal is to nurture yourself. And that's what I had always maintained was that when you break bread with somebody at a table and when you sit at the table with someone, even when you sit for a nice meal, I've lived alone, but you know, before when you sit for a nice meal, it's the most, one of the most intimate ways that you can nurture yourself. And one of the most intimate ways you can nurture someone else is by feeding them is by giving them uh, nourishment so that they have the tools to go out and have a good day, to be focused, to be aware. Um, that's why we pack, you know, backpacks for children who don't have food to go the weekend, right? And need that because that, without that, where do we expect them to go? So um, for me, it all started at that table. It all started with feeding yourself. And, you know, that can extrapolate onto a lot of other things besides food. But um, so sat down and obviously there was much more there for me than just, Hey, let's see what this, you know, if this sauce is popular or not. Um, it really became more of a way for me to give back to the community and to give back to others to allow them, you know, I gave my family this love. They could give their family and friends and themselves this love. And then I, for me, it's really important to be involved in the community and to give back to the community and to be connected um, because it takes a village and that just brings it full circle. So to be able to do good through the company was wow. really important for me too. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing your story. Um, I think, I mean, this happens to me and, you know, I, I have conversations with a lot of people being, being on the show. Um, you know, there's a, there's a common thread about, 
uh, doing what we feel like we're supposed to do, right? That's that to me. That's one of the characteristic, like main characteristic traits of an entrepreneur is I've got to do what I feel like I'm supposed to do, like I'm like I'm made to do, like I I I, I feel like I have to do this, right? And um, it, it sounded like you battled that for for a while. Um, what was it? What are some of the signs and symptoms if you feel like you're not living uh, what you're supposed to do? So probably about nine months into my experimenting, eh, maybe seven or eight into my like experimenting behind the scenes with my dad, I ended up quitting my job and I was, I knew I wanted to go elsewhere, but I didn't know where that was. And I sure as hell did not think it was to open a soft company or to start a soft company at all. Um, I wanted to go into coaching and I wanted to go to do more philanthropically. Um, and, and so I explored those avenues and I, my old partners at work um, were using some coaches and they said, you know, what can it hurt? Um, my buddy Matt said, what can it hurt to, you know, do this? and connect you with Nancy and Rick and let's, you know, see where it can go. At least you'll make some good friends. And um, long story short, he's gone and, you know, kind of done his own thing. And it's all because we were able to kind of shift this mindset. So I went into this course with them um, thinking that we would partner together and we would um, move forward um, to revamp some, some courses for women, which was something that I was really passionate about lifting up women. Um, and so two thirds of the way into that course, I, I realized that my heart was taking me to another place. So, um, so I fought that for a really long time and then for a few weeks. And then when I finally thought, oh my gosh, this is where I'm supposed to be the fear set in and I cried for like three or four days. It was hilarious and awful all at the same time. But then after that, I was like, okay, I'm ready. I can do this. You know, this is scary as I'll get out, but here we go. Self-awareness is a big piece. And I'm honestly, if you probably ask my boyfriend, he's like, okay, can you just stop like working on yourself and let's just be and watch like Dumber and Dumber and just sit. So for me, the self-awareness piece and the willingness to do the work internally is where it all starts because, um, you know, there's a couple other entrepreneurs out there um, in the Orlando community. They're doing purpose work and they're doing wonderful purpose work. Um, and when you meet people like that, that really say, hey, I've, I've done the work on myself. And Lord knows I'm far from perfect, but we're getting there. And every day is a step, sometimes backwards, sometimes forward, but it's, it's all part of the journey. And that is, I think, key is first and foremost, being able to look inside yourself and see what's missing. If you really feel like there's something you're supposed to do, what is it? Because so many people don't even ask that question. I mean, they, they just assume it's the first thing that comes to mind. But when you think of creativity, the really great ideas, and I'm by no means crediting myself for this, like really great ideas where you see others and you go, man, where did that come from? That was probably three, four, five layers deep for them. Um, where, you know, the, the top creativity, there's a professor, he runs the Idea Lab over at UCF, and he teaches a class on creativity. And he will tell you, man, I ask engineers all the time, how many ideas did you come up with? And they're like, oh, a lot. And he goes, come on, you know, quantify that for me. And then he's like, the answer's always five. Five is not a lot of ideas. He's like, come up with 30 ideas. The first 10 are going to be your baseline. I'm swimming in the shallow end. I think I'm being creative. The second 10 are going to be, hey, these have a little more, uh, I don't know if you want to call it craziness. He, he probably has better terminology for it, but these have a little bit more weight to them as far as trailblazers and innovation. And then the last 10 will be completely kind of off the wall, wacky stuff. 
And that's where there's some gold there, you know, and when you get a group of five people, you've got 150 ideas that you're throwing. You want to talk about throwing stuff on the wall and seeing if it sticks. You've got to come, dig deep to find something in that last 10 when you're trying to be creative because we've lost so much of it. I look at my seven-year-old and she is, I don't know if you have kids, but like I look at my seven-year-old and I'm like, man, she can come up with wacky stuff on a hourly basis, minute basis. You just give her a tangent and she goes. And I'm like, I want to bottle that and keep it because we lose so much of that over the course of life. So first and foremost, I would say, ask yourself the tough questions. What is it? Why am I doing this? What if it doesn't work? Right? What if it fails? Because if you're playing odds, that's the truth. But on the flip side, we were just talking about this this weekend because she was brainstorming about something at a staycation we took and opening a toy hotel and all these things. And, and she, she goes, I have to go to the bathroom. So we go to the bathroom. She stops. She goes, mom, what if someone tells me you can't open a toy hotel like that? Or you can't do this like that. And I go, well, babe, you know what? Someone will tell you that. There'll be plenty of people that are willing to tell you that. The whole point is you want to listen to them. So self-awareness, um, having your, your inner voice and your inner dialogue clear, and then, and then embracing the fear is, is a big one for me because I don't know that there's any entrep- entrepreneur that doesn't feel fear. Um, there's plenty of people in corporate jobs that feel fear and they do it anyway, you know? Um, but, but being able to lean into that fear and take the the nuggets from it and take the lessons and not let it prohibit us from taking that step anyway. Because sometimes there'll be real valid concerns in that fear. Um, but our monkey minds, um, kind of get in the way of a lot of that stuff. So then you end up listening to them and you just completely ditch whatever was really a good, a good lesson or a good direction for you to head in. I love this. So I was taking a bunch of notes. Um, (laughs) The beautiful thing about being a podcast host is I get to, uh, I get to take really good notes and I get free advice all day long. (laughs) Um, So, you know, let me just highlight some of the things that, that we hit. And then, um, you know, this has absolutely nothing to do with the topic of foodpreneur. However, it has everything to do with becoming an entrepreneur. And I love this because it sounded like your heart is to, uh, you definitely want to bring love to the table, but you're, you're also about nourishing people. And specifically what I, what I heard is you have a heart to lift up entrepreneurial women. And, um, you, you drop some really good, I call them value bombs or golden nuggets. Um, you know, when you when you started this, um, you say you got to do the work internally, and I think that a lot of times we get caught up in bills, we get caught up in the cars we drive about what the bank account looks like, or what our expectations are on us through a spouse, through parents, through you know through employers, and just through the community, and sometimes we we lose track of what that internal you know voices or whatever. Um, and I think that, you know, hearing you say that it, it, you have to do the work on yourself. It is a part of the journey and you have to, you have to be self-aware and embrace the fear. So I, with your permission, I'd like to, I'd like to, I'd like to dive in a little bit there because I think that there's uh, someone in the audience, um, you know, who's really struggling with this idea and uh, the self-awareness and introspection. And I think that we could all benefit from hearing your thoughts on it with your permission i'd like to ask some questions about that yeah sure okay cool so um you said that when you when it first hit you 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 know you were thinking about doing some coaching you left your job and you were in this class and you were kind of feeling a groove and then you said this isn't it and you said you cried for three days like like what happened in those three days and like what, what was going through your head during this time? If, if you don't mind sharing that with the audience, with the whole world. Oh, not at all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> world life. No, not at, not at all. Um, 
So I first and foremost have to give a shout out to my partner because I was probably like a crazy person, you know, behind the scenes during that time. And, you know, for me specifically, and I can't speak for everyone, but for me specifically, um, he's been the best support system than I can have. He is my biggest cheerleader. And I didn't have that before. So I know very well what it's like to not have that and try to move forward. And it is like swimming upstream um, and in anything. It doesn't matter whether it's entrepreneurialism or just baby steps to get back to yourself, right? Um, so, so I was very fortunate to be able to say, hey, I'm going to make this step and leave my job. And this means a little bit of financial instability, even if you plan, but how to work around this. And I had a, a safety net there, right? And I would not have been able to do that. Um, if like you, people say like, oh, you did all this work. I always say this, you did all this work by yourself. But you're like, no, I don't care if you were a team of one on paper, in books or magazines, like no one does things by themselves. Um, whether it's someone giving you a hand up, a hand out, a helping, whatever it is, um, a word of encouragement, you need those things. And so I think it's important to note that because then people are like, oh, well, so-and-so, and no, no. So for me, having that support system was really important. Um, but it did kind of feel like my mind was all over the place. And I, you know, had gotten to a point where I had stretched myself too thin with so many things that I wanted to work on. And it wasn't about spreading myself thin. It was about going narrow and deep. And something about the coaching and all of those other avenues um, I, I journal a lot. Um, I write a lot. I read um, or listen to podcasts. Like everything self-help usually has my name on it. <laughs> uh, at least a little bit because there's so many lessons we can learn every single day. And um, for me, you know, it's easy. I have a, my, my mom shoulds all, of, all over everything. You should be doing this. You should be doing, why aren't you doing this? Da, 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 da. And I always joke, then you've got a, a pile of should. Nobody likes a pile of should. And that's bullshit, right? So um, for me, I needed, I need that like motivation to keep my mind in a place of gratitude. Um, and I need to be able to be aware of my thoughts enough so that I can shift them when they're not in the place of gratitude, because there's a lot to be thankful for daily. So for me, when I got to that point where literally the walls of fear felt like they were punching me in the face, like consistently, I remember emptying the dishwasher and, you know, just after dinner and I was like, holy crap, I am so scared, you know, because there came that moment for me internally where I had kind of mapped out what my options were on a paper and I was looking down at them and I was trying to do some journaling. I was working with a life coach at the same time, um, which I'm a big believer in therapy. I will put that out there completely. I'm a big believer in doing whatever makes you the best you. And what it is for you or Joe or Cindy is not going to be it for me. It's going to look different for every single person. So that's another should we can take off the table, right? Um, but so for me, that was a distinction and a time in my life where I realized the life coach and the, the business coaches were doing something very different for me than therapy was. Like you can do internal work, but then uh, they, they added value in a different way and a, and a very um, career and life oriented way versus just internally. They shifted the, the focus outward. And so I had been doing the work and I had mapped out all this stuff and was going through a journaling session and it really just hit me that that was, that was where I was supposed to be. There was this nagging feeling that I couldn't let, if I was going to go narrow and deep, I wasn't going to let the soft line go for whatever reason. And that's something that I always keep 
on the forefront of my mind because when I started it, even just with my dad behind the scenes, I was like, you know what? If this goes nowhere, the lessons I'm going to learn, whether it's about food, you know, entrepreneurship or entrepreneurship or just this entire business journey is going to take me someplace where I need to be. Um, and those lessons are going to be invaluable to me. So I, whenever there's a valley, whenever, like I always am like, okay, well, don't get too high on your horse or don't get too low on your horse. Remember, it's about the journey. These lessons are what you're taking with you. And so um, for me, that was the crying. The crying was all of my walls coming in. Once I realized, like, if this is the one thing that I can't let go of, why am I not why am I not doing this? Why isn't this at the top of the list? Why isn't this what I'm devoting my time to? And it was for a myriad of reasons that had to do with limitations, right? That were money, that was um, fear of the unknown, that was I've never started anything before, that was what if this goes nowhere? What if this a waste of time? Like all of those limiting beliefs that come up um, not just with entrepreneurship. What if I'm not good enough? What if no one likes it? You know, um, because like I had listened to your episode with Jesse and he is amazing. And like he had some proof of concept there, right? Where like you make it for your friends and like, yeah, I had proof of concept with my family, but I didn't make it. It was my dad making it, you know, I didn't bottle with it or so it, all of those beliefs came up and it was when I was going through my divorce, for me, what was really important was to listen to my inner voice. I realized during that process that I had very good um, intuition, which I think a lot of women, and I don't mean to single you out on the other side, Josh, but women hey. <laughs> inherently, yeah, like, no, not, not men. <laughs> women inherently have very good instincts, and they don't listen to those instincts darn near enough. Um, and for me, I realized it was real important for me to listen to my instinct, even if it didn't make a lot of sense, um, or at least, at least delve deeper into it. And so I just had that instinct and I had to bat away the fear every time it came. And what was funny is it was that new car effect, right? Like as soon as I got to a place where I was like, okay, I've worked out all of my junk that's associated with this. Let's go. And it's however you would, it, I'm not saying that's the way to do it. I'm just saying like, it's however you work things out on your own. I'm a crier. I'm, I've admitted this readily to most people. Um, I get stuff out and then I can put it on, I can detox. I've had a good cry. I can move on. Um, same with things that come up. I get it out verbally. I'm a talker, but other people, you know, can go through that process internally. They can do it via other methods, like whatever it is that helps you work through your shit. Um, and then once I did that, I had a clear head. I was focused. I was like, okay, well, let's hit the ground running. I don't know where the heck I'm running to, but we're going. And it was like the new car effect. Like you buy a car and then all of a sudden you see it everywhere. The universe started giving me some of those opportunities that said, hey, th this is affirming your choice. This is because your eyes are open to it. Your eyes are looking for um, all of those affirming signs. And that was what was coming up for me. But before that, I had no definition. So it was hard to figure out with all of the mixed messages coming in. So you had to take, um, you had to take some time to, to tear away, to break you know, from the old, right? And then you started, you, you took a, a leap of faith. You took, you know, I'm going to listen to my intuition. And I, I agree with you. Women are so much better at it than, than, than us guys. Uh, I'll speak on behalf of all men out there. You guys got that nail. <laughs> and, and also crying, but I'm a, I'm a crier too. <laughs> so we're, we're with each other on that. Um, even commercials sometimes make me cry. I'm so <laughs> My wife looks over and like, what is going on? <laughs> so, I love it. That's my boyfriend. He's like, you need a hug. Come on. I'm like, darn it. This stupid commercial. Yeah. yeah. Don't tell anybody though, Barbara. Let's keep that between you and I. All right. <laughs> we'll and just keep that between us and the world, right? 
Yeah, awesome. So um, you took a leap of faith and you started to see in these positive affirmations, right? Like these positive like feedback loop that you're like, okay, I'm heading in the right direction, right? What were some of those? Um, perfect example. I had met with a graphic designer a few months before that to just flesh out what, you know, if I were making labels, what they would look like. And literally, I think two days after I had made the decision, she texts me and goes, hey, East End is having this foodpreneur course 101. I saw this and thought of you. And I'm like, done. I literally signed up the moment she sent it to me. My friend that runs a, a farming house out of East End that's a dinner delivery, delicious takeout service. Um, she sent me a message and is like, hey, do you think you would be willing to sell us some of your mojo sauce to use in some of our dishes this week? I was like, I mean, and you could say, oh, those things came out of no or came out of um, work beforehand. But no, they were little tiny seeds that I had maybe planted elsewhere because I was talking about it. But I talking is, is good. But then at some point you get tired of talking, you have to do. And so I had kind of stopped talking because I was like, no, I have to do, I have to execute and I have to get stuff done because otherwise no one wants a sauce that you're talking about that you can't buy anywhere or that isn't actually materialized. And so she reached out, my graphic designer reached out. Oh gosh, what else? There were a couple of other, I mean, very palpable signs that, came into play that I was like, wow, this could not have come at a better time because now I know I'm here in this space, right? And here are opportunities, here are opportunities to participate and to be, um, to, to be present in the space of beginning this company. Yeah, man, this is so good. And you know what? <laughs> we haven't really talked about the details of of your of your company and the food but it's just like i i feel like this has been like such a good conversation and i think that this has been so valuable for myself like i've got you know a few pages of notes and and just for the people listening and it's been it's very encouraging i do want to hear and we want to hear about the business side of your thing um talk to us a little a little bit about about your business and and about you know where can people find it and and some more information about like uh, what you're what you're doing? Where's your business at now? Yep. So I went back and forth. So I hit the ground running. We're in. It's been two years. So we're in about forty something stores in Florida. We're in Lucky's, which is kind of the biggest chain, and Chamberlain's, which is well known throughout Central Florida. Lucky's is a little more kind of nationwide. They were bought out by Kroger a couple Aprils ago. And so they're, they've got an aggressive expansion plan throughout the state, and then they're building, you know, a ton of more stores here. Um, obviously, I want to get into some bigger major markets, but I'm really thankful to have Lucky's and Chamberlain's as, as major partners. Um, Ancient Olive, East End Market, um, Meat House, Petties, uh, Wassies down in Melbourne, uh, Modica Market up in the Panhandle. So those are kind of some local shout outs to retailers because I mean, they're doing the hard work too. They've got, you know, businesses to run and revenue goals to meet and everything else. Um, so I worked on it full time for about a year and then ended up going back into full time work because of those limitations that happen, right? Like where, Hey, you have to make ends meet and you have to pay the bills somehow and you can drain your savings so much or rely on partnerships and everything else. But like life push comes to shove. I've got a seven year old to feed and you know, we're eating each other out of house and home. So um, I went into full-time work and thought, okay, I can balance these two. And I, I thought this is, I can totally do this. And I'll be honest, I don't think I could totally do it. I don't know how anybody does it. Um, it is hard as all get out. And um, you really have to like want to work late nights and want to work weekends and really, you know, realize even though this sucks right now, it is going to be worth it in the end. Um, so that slowed down. Like I felt like I made a lot of progress in that first year. And then 
I kind of plateaued and let it run a little bit on autopilot. And um, what's funny is I had met someone at a million cups here and he and I started meeting and he, he and I met and we were like, we don't know exactly what our partnership is or will be, but there's just something there that keeps us meeting again, a gut instinct. So let's follow that. What's the worst that can happen? You're good friends, whatever. Um, you make a new friend and you build a new relationship. Right. And, um, and he helped me ramp back up a little bit to where when I was like, I can't, you know, I, I'm just, I'm spent. I am like emotionally drained. He'd be like, okay, well, let me help. How can I do this? Or let me make some deliveries or, or let me check out these new venues for you. Um, and that has turned into a good partnership, right? Like where we don't know exactly what that looks like, but we're keeping each other afloat and he believed in me and I believe in him and his other entrepreneurial ventures. And so, um, so long story short, I'm not in full-time employment anymore. Um, and I'm giving myself a lot of grace. I'm working on some new sauces and they're not ramping up as quickly. Like I'm, I'm laying it out on the line for you because this is, I feel like everybody is like, Oh, well you have to make, you know, your company and everything else look great on the outside and that's what people want to hear but at the end of the day everybody's working really hard behind the scenes and it looks great like we've had really good success with William Sonoma and like the stores that we go visit we always get rave reviews we always get great but you know my first batch of bottles that came off my first ooh my first few batches of bottles that came off i had to peel the little cutouts off of the bottles manually Menu by hand. So people are like, oh, I love this. I'm like, my thumb is raw. I have peeled thousands on thousands of bottles just to get them out the door. So, you know, now I'm at a place where I feel like I've fallen behind um, a bit. And I am trying to give myself the grace that I would want to give another person, um, which is, hey, life has seasons, life has chapters. And part of the reason why I'm not doing both jobs anymore is because, you know, I want to devote some time to my family. Like you get one shot at raising good humans. And um, that may not be on everyone else's priority list. Everyone's is different. I know for me, it's an important priority. Um, so that being said, um, you know, I was lucky enough to meet with Jesse. I've met with a bunch of people in the community that are like, hey, how can I help? Let's work on this. Let's develop this new sauce. Let's figure this out. And then it's putting your money where your mouth is and getting behind there and doing the work and, and just, you know, smelling like garlic in your kitchen while you try out new recipes and, you know, thinking, okay, well, I don't want to do a demo this weekend, but okay, I'm going to get out there and have people check this out because whenever you get out there, it's like you're re-inspired and you're re-invigorated um, to go, okay, no, this is something. This is not um, when you don't believe in yourself, others do, right? Like, or when you're going through like, Hey, I've just got too much that I can more than I can handle, um, on my plate. And I don't have anything to complain about now, but when you're in those moments, um, being able to rely on that support system. Um, so my business is re growing again. Uh, thankfully, but I really felt like it plateaued there for a little bit. And I know for me, one of the things that helped me that first year to really hit the ground running a lot was that every time I would come up with a problem, this was again, back to my coaches too. Every time I would come up with a problem um, that felt too big for me to handle, I would create a bigger problem. I'd pick up the phone and call a store and say, Hey, do you want to sample some sauce? Can I, can I come by and drop off some bottles? And then all of a sudden, that's how I got my first customers. All of a sudden, I had to decide on my labels, which were really big, a big deal for me because I'm not a visual person. Um, all of a sudden, I had customers. So then I'm like, oh, damn, I have to have a bottle to give these people because they just purchased from me. Or, um, you know, okay, I've got to go do some more distribution. So this makes all this stuff. Let's just sweep this under the rug. We got this and keep going. Um, so it's keeping things in perspective. 
Wow, the way to progress is making bigger problems. <laughs> this is that is an I, interesting I, I, approach. I, Nancy and Rig gave me that one. Yes, I and and it works. And it absolutely works. Cool, cool. Well, this is this has been incredibly fun. Um, where could go? Where could people go to find out more about you, about your sauces and your story? Do you know that I realized we're like at the hour mark and I have not touched upon like female entrepreneurship, like, you know, making the rules, all the things um, that I think we both wanted to touch on. So I am sorry for that. I'm not sorry for real, but I, you know, thank you for your patience and your listening, Josh. <laughs> hey, no. So before the call, for the people listening in, like let's let's let them behind the scenes. Before uh, we hit record, we had a really great conversation about female entrepreneurship and and about you know life and just like the life of an entrepreneur. And you really like created some some great like tidbits. So what I'll do is I'll just uh, share a few of those, and then maybe we can unpack one of them. If people are listening in and you know they could they could listen for a little bit longer, but you you shared two two things that that uh, I'll, I'll share, and then you could unpack one of them and go in greater detail. Does that sound fun? Yeah, that sounds perfect. Okay, so uh, one of the things that you said is if you don't like the rules, make up your own. And then the second one was, who gets to decide who defines your reality? Right. So uh, as as a exit to this interview um which one would you like to talk about because we want to hear your thoughts on one of those i'm going to say if you don't like the rules make up your own um okay because that leads into that other one for me so that was in that business course that helped me launch um the company you know at the beginning of the course we make some agreements and um it all kind of sounds cryptic from the outside, but you make some agreements and you agree to follow certain rules for the class. Um, and it's out of respect and it's out of the fact that we're all on the same page. And so you do that. And one of the tenements that they talk about is if you don't like the rules, make up your own. And you think about our world and we all follow rules. We follow rules um, that are sometimes decided for us that we inherently agree to. Let's stop at the stop sign. Let's go when the light goes green. Um, you know, do not kill, do not steal, do not, you know, covet thy neighbor's wife, whatever. All Whether they're moral or legal rules, we've got them. But then as we grow up, right, there are some rules that are put in place for our safety. Don't touch the stove when it's hot. Don't, you know, a funny, don't put your hand in your pants. <laughs> like, I've got kids, right? So, or I've got a kid. So, like, hey, keep your hand out of your pants. It's not okay. So, can those check. rules. Right. <laughs> hand check. Um, <laughs> I love that. So, yes, you follow certain rules to to maintain a safe existence. But then all of a sudden, you keep getting older and whether it's social graces, whether it's life rules, whether it's, hey, you should do this, you should do that, oh, you really should think about getting this or buying that, all of those are in our subconscious. And who, who said we had to agree to them? Who decided? Um, and that comes back to our choice. Our choice is always there, and we give of it so freely to other people. We give that up. Um, so if you're unhappy going back to like full circle, when you asked me at the beginning, Hey, what about people who feel like they don't follow what they should, what they should be doing, what they think is a passion or a purpose for them. If you are unhappy, figure out your why, figure out what rules you're following that make you unhappy and make make up your own um redefine what your reality looks like now if you don't like that if that doesn't make you happy then the onus is on you to change that then the onus is on you to be accountable for that and do something different but don't be afraid of 
what those rules could be. Don't let the fear, don't let all the other obstacles, don't let the the people putting the rules in your head, society, um, as women, right? You should be doing this. You should, this makes you a good mother, a good, um, employee. Uh, you know, we talk about salary negotiations a little bit, bit of a tangent, but we talk about salary negotiations in women versus men, right? Like men will go after what they want. Um, women will notoriously negotiate just a little bit if they're there right? If not, they will accept an offer, right? So like, don't let all of those societal rules or all of those pressures be what dictates who you become and where you are. I think that is incredible um, advice to, to live by. And I appreciate you sharing that with us. That's, that's incredible. So uh, we do, and we are wrapping up. <laughs> uh, how can people find you, Barbara? Um, you can find me on Facebook, on Instagram, we're Sweet, we're Sweet Babs Sauces on Instagram, Sweet Babs Brands on Facebook, um, LinkedIn. Um, we have a website, sweetbabsbrands.com, and we ship nationwide, we ship internationally, um, we ship in bulk. So, and if there's any questions, like reach out to me. I am uh, happy to answer any questions. If not, have some of my you know team answer any questions. I we're here to serve and allow others to serve too. Food. That's awesome. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, listening in, uh, this has been a really fun interview, a really fun conversation um, that, that we had with Barbara here about bringing, you know, love to the table and she's doing it through her sauces and her food uh, preneur adventures. So we just want to say thank you for, for being a part of our audience and listening in. And um, I, I encourage you to reach out to Barbara and, and take a look at their sauces and, and the mama and the papa. And if you'd like a little bit of spicy and you want to sweat when you eat, maybe go with the papa a little bit. But uh, <laughs> that sounds a little. <laughs> Anyways, ladies and gentlemen, yeah. thank you for listening in <laughs> to the show. Uh, <laughs> we'll talk to you all on the next episode. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye, Barbara. Thank you for listening in on today's episode. If you would like to be a guest on the show or start a conversation with me, Josh, your host, send me an email to josh at orlandoentrepreneurs.org. You can also find out more information on Orlando's entrepreneurial ecosystem, discover resources to help you start and grow your business, and subscribe to future shows by visiting www.orlandoentrepreneurs.org.